thank you very much um, to the IRPP and to the One Foundation for inviting me to moderate this very important conversation. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. It's going to be a, a very interesting discussion about how we recover from the economic havoc unleashed by the COVID-19 pandemic. Lockdowns have shrunk all of our economies, um, slowed down tourism, created problems in the supply chain and slowed trade worldwide. The World Bank's latest forecast is quite grim. It is now saying that growth will slow by more than 4% this year compared to last, that the gap in inequality is growing and that developing economies are coming in for a hard landing. Extreme poverty is also set to increase for the first time in two decades. Still, for Canada and other wealthy countries, the outlook is less grim. Our vaccination rate is one of the highest in the world. And before Omicron, our economy roared back in the last quarter of 2021. So how can we help those who are less fortunate? How can we help boost vaccination rates elsewhere? And what financial support should Canada be giving to poorer countries as they battle the economic impacts of COVID-19? weighty questions, and to answer them, I am joined, thankfully, by three of the smartest people in the world when it comes to global health and development. Mark Plant is the Chief, Chief Operating Officer of the Centre for Global Development Europe. Prior to that, he had a long career at the International Monetary Fund, where he held various positions, working extensively with African countries, culminating in his appointment as Deputy Director of the IMF's African Department. Welcome, Mark. Thank you, Melissa. It's a pleasure to be here. Dr. Joanne Liu is a pediatric emergency room physician and the former international president of Médecins Sans Frontières, Doctors Without Borders. She's a professor at McGill University, where her work focuses on pandemic and health emergencies. She's also a member of the Independent Panel on Pandemic Preparedness and Response. Welcome, Joanne. Good day, everybody. Thank you. Micah Sonderji is an assistant professor at the School of International Development and Global Studies at the University of, of Ottawa. In 2021, she was awarded the Talent Impact Award by the Social Science and Humanities Research Council of Canada and the Alice Wilson Award by the Royal Society of Canada. She's a regular contributor to Le Devoir and Nouveau. Micah, welcome. Nice to see you. Thank you all so much for being here. I know our time is really limited and I want to make sure we save room for audience questions. So I'm just going to launch right in. Um, we are now entering the third year of this pandemic and every day Omicron reminds us that it's far from over. I'm coming to you from London, UK, and we had about 100,000 new infections just yesterday. 3 billion people worldwide remain unvaccinated. And while Canada may have one of the highest vaccination rates in the world, we've been slow in meeting our commitment to donate vaccines to developing countries. Joanne, how did we miss an opportunity to take the lead here? And in terms of Canada's COVID response, how do you think we did? Well, I think that uh, Canada, um, first of all, um, started on the right foot to a certain extent. At uh, the beginning of the pandemic, they basically uh, committed to uh, end and spend $2.5 billion on international aid, which is massive. They actually supported the ACTA platform, which is the R&D platform uh, for discovery for uh, COVID-19 tools like vaccines, but as well rapid diagnostic tests and therapeutic. And they basically given uh, $1.2 billion on this. So that is great. I think that where things uh, are getting a little bit less great is when we, we look at in the vaccine that they have promised, which is an equivalent of 200 million vaccine, they say 50 million would be in kind. And so far of those 50 million, about a quarter has been delivered. And so uh, I think that it would have been ideal that they try to fast track the sharing much faster in 2021 uh, and uh, instead of looking and waiting uh, for 2022 because at the outlook right now when we um, 
we are looking at figures is most likely 2022 will not be uh, the same issue as 2021, which was a supply issue, but it's gonna be much more a distribution issue within countries. And so uh, by waiting for the system to deliver, and we think that the system of COVAX is most likely, which is a platform for distribution, equitable distribution, we most likely uh, will have some tough time to uh, basically distribute vaccine within countries. So what Canada could have done better? I think Canada could have used its weight in, 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 in uh, basically encouraging and leading by example, by fast tracking is sharing, that's number one. Number two, I think that it could, we have what we call the Canadian access to medicine regime, which is something that was uh, launched uh, in 2003, that was initially called Jean Chrétien Pledge for Africa, but it was back then, you know, to make access of ARVs that were produced in, in Canada of, uh, of uh, ARVs that were still under patented and could be uh, after that uh, exported. And, and they haven't added yet the, uh, the product of COVID-19 to this uh, uh, Canadian access to medicine regime. And the other thing, and it, although we know that we're not deliver right away, it's a TRIPS waiver. And it's just basically um, waiving the, um, the, the patent on, on, uh, on vaccine, but as well on, on rapid diagnostic tests and on therapeutic. And, and we all know that there's no magic wand. We all know there's no silver bullet to that, but we need to start somewhere. And then those steps that some of them are somehow much more, you know, we say a posture did not, uh, haven't been done. So the issue is, is it's not enough to throw money at a problem. You need to do basically walk the talk. And I think Canada did not walk the talk in terms of its solidarity uh, towards the rest of the world, and it can do better. And now we're facing the incredible situation, I'm gonna stop after that, on the fact that Air Infinity are saying, you know, there's 240 million vaccines are about to expire in, in uh, 2022. And I guess my colleague on the panel will be able to comment on that. But, uh, and, 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 and so we're, we're facing a real uh, issue of how we're gonna be able to distribute those vaccines and the likeliness that is going to be uh, possibly destroyed is fairly high. So, uh, so what can I do? Canada can do for that, and and the reality is really to step up in terms of helping of distribution within country. And as we know that we're going to vote our budget at the end of February, beginning of March, we need to increase our ODA money. I'm sure that Mark has much much more to say about that. But uh, it's, if, if we want countries to recover, it won't be enough to throw at them vaccine and hope for the best. But we're going to need to help them basically absorb those vaccines, distribute them, and strengthen the healthcare system. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joanne. Hold on to that thought because I was very surprised that Canada was actually not uh, one of the holdouts for the TRIPS waiver at the WTO. So I want to come back to that at some point later on in the conversation um, about the reasons why that might be. Micah, I'm going to go to ask you now. You recently wrote about the example of Nigeria, um, a country where less than 7% of the population has had one dose not even to mention fully, vaccinate, fully vaccinated. And the fact that they had to throw away about a million doses right before Christmas because they received them only a few days before the expiration date um, in terms of donations. It's what some people are calling vaccine apartheid. Um, can you explain what that term means and what we as a G7 country should be doing about it? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Melissa. And I'm, I'm basically going to echo what uh, Dr. Liu has just said. I think uh, giving vaccines to make us feel better is nothing. One vaccine doesn't mean one vaccination. There's much more that we need to actually get vaccines to people. And so Canada is going to have a lot to do and can do a lot uh, to help for that. But so the vaccine apartheid is basically what we're seeing right now is that that approach of every country for themselves. So some countries are piling up, stockpiling, hoarding vaccines while other countries are not. And on the one side, it was a collective effort. And I think we're forgetting that. It, it was not just the pharmaceutical doing research and development for, for the development of vaccines. It was scientific scientific scientists from all over the world. It was uh, Global South and Global North uh, governments sharing information. Uh, it was a, a 
a lot of public investment also. And so on the one side, it's a collective effort. And on the other side, we're seeing a huge disparity in, in uh, distribution of vaccines. And Dr. Lee is right to say that it's not a problem of produ production anymore. It's a problem of distribution. And, and this inequality is based on uh, a, what I call a colonial line or north-south line, which is not surprising, but it's still, I think, in terms of crisis where we see that these lines are, are, are reinforced. Uh, and that's what many commentators have, comment, have, have talked about at the beginning of the crisis. Dr. Liu wrote about it, gave hundreds of interviews about it. I wrote about it in the first weeks of the pandemic so that we can prevent that. And we still ran right into it. And so what Canada can do many things, uh, partly uh, the TRIPS waiver, which is a huge issue and on which Canada has not been a leader, uh, despite the fact that just Justin Trudeau ran on a platform of being a leader, a champion of, of multilateralism and a champion of global solidarity, which uh, has not proven proven to be the case in terms of in times of crisis. And I think we often say in times of crisis, we see the true uh, character of people. I think in time in, in those times, we're seeing the true character of uh, some countries. We're seeing a lot of solidarity in uh, in the African continent between countries. The African Union is a great example of, of sharing information and, and coordinating uh, solutions. Uh, many other things we can do is trust our global institutions. I think there's been a lot of mistrust and a lot of um, lack of, of uh, confidence in the World Health Organization. I think we're seeing now that if we had followed uh, the recommendations, we would be elsewhere today we wouldn't be in that situation we might have uh, already gone out of the out of the crisis especially with COVAX which was a great initiative which was signed by many countries um, and was not followed as it was supposed to so now we're in that situation where as you said we're giving doses to countries uh, a few days or, or a week or two before it, it, they expire and we, we tell the we, we think that those countries don't have the capacity to vaccinate it's not a problem of, of, of capacity it's a problem of predictability it, you need to be able to predict how many doses you're going to receive in order to be able to organize a, a large scale vaccination campaign. And, and I think, uh, I don't know, uh, my family comes from Madagascar, but I have colleagues all over uh, uh, the world and, and we see expertise, we, we see huge expertise in, in uh, sub-Saharan African countries in terms of large scale vaccination campaigns, not in Canada. We don't have the expertise here because it's been uh, running pretty smoothly in the past uh, decades. So, uh, it's not a question of, of expertise, but of uh, predictability. And then another thing I think is put caps on prof profits for uh, pharmaceuticals. And I'm surprised that's not something we talk about more. Um, lowering prices. Uh, I think some companies are doing it, but a lot of others are, are, are making a lot of profit on the crisis, not just for vaccines, but for a syringe and a lot of other everything that needs, needs to be produced for, for vaccination. Uh, and it has been done before. Governments have had in the past, have imposed uh, uh, prices and I've, I've asked companies, I've forced companies to produce a certain amount for certain, uh, especially when we were afraid of chemical attacks. So it's it's been done before. So many other things, I think trusting multilateralism and, and becoming a what we were supposed to be with the liberal government, which is a leader in terms of global solidarity and multilateralism, I think would be the main, the main issue being a, a being first and for like being at the at the forefront of uh, solidarity and, and soft diplomacy, because we're seeing now that the countries who are doing uh, soft diplomacy and vaccine diplomacy are gaining power in the, in the international level. And I think that's that's the way to go. Thanks, Micah. Um, vaccine equity is clearly only the beginning of all of this. Um, pandemic has exacerbated income inequality, both across and within countries. The IMF says it's wiped out years of progress in terms of poverty reduction, especially in the Global South Mark. Um, what's your assessment of where we are at today globally and what responsibility do we as Canada and as the richer countries have to help poorer countries recover economically? And aside from vaccine donations, um, what other tools are available to us? Melissa, you're right. The economic impact of the pandemic has been very deep. It's slowed production, it's disrupted global trade, it's resulted in the loss of millions of jobs, both formal and informal. And each of us has seen this in our own lives, but in low and middle income countries, the devastation has been even more enormous. Advanced countries have been able to step in to limit the damage to their own economies, 
with huge government spending packages and financial support from the central banks, upwards of 8% of GDP. However, most low and middle income countries couldn't do that. The economic tools they could employ were much more limited and they spent around 1% of GDP in trying to support uh, their people. That's not nearly enough for the severity of this pandemic and the economic crisis that followed. Many of the countries in the global south were economically vulnerable before the crisis and COVID has worsened, worsened the situation more. The bottom line is that hundreds of millions of people have been plunged back into poverty. Normally, when the world sees a crisis like this, it's in a particular country and donors can increase aid. But in this situation, it's a global crisis and all the richer countries are having problems of their own. They have their own political uh, forces to face. Logistically, it's different to give aid on a scale that's needed. And so I think the international community has been really struggling as to how to find a global solution to get the resources out to the countries that need, need them. There was one truly global effort in the last two years to help out struggling countries and was made by the International Monetary Fund or the IMF. Uh, and that's really made by the world because the world owns the IMF. The IMF has its own currency. It's called Special Drawing Rights, SDRs. It's a currency that's held exclusively by central banks and it's meant to provide them access to foreign currency reserves, dollars or euros or yen, when they need it. And because of the crisis, uh, most central banks of the developing world were squeezed on currency reserves. For example, countries that exported raw materials saw their export markets collapse along with their income from abroad. This in turn prevented them from buying foreign goods like vaccines, PPE, medical supplies, food imports, all the things that these countries need to keep their population healthy and, uh, and well fed. So in August, 2021, the countries of the world unanimously authorized the IMF to issue $650 billion worth of these SDRs to the World Central Bank to give them some more cushion so that they could access reserves and buy things uh, from abroad. Every central bank got a share of this pot of extra liquidity. The formula that was used to distribute the SDRs was written into IMF law and was designed a long time ago, and it was meant to address possible international financial market failures, not the kind of global failure we had with the pan global economic failure we had with the pandemic. So the money didn't necessarily go where it was needed the most. Most of it, in fact, went to the rich countries, and only about 30 billion of the 650 billion went to the low income vulnerable countries. And even among the low income and vulnerable countries, the distribution was even and uneven and strange. For example, Liberia got an allocation equal to about 10% of its GDP, while Cameroon, their new SDRs amounted to less than 1% of GDP. So this formula was designed for something else and was being used for the pandemic. For the pandemic. About $450 billion worth of these SDRs went to G20 countries, again, who really didn't need them. So the G20, uh, and Canada was a leading voice there, committed to reallocate at least $100 billion of these SDRs to vulnerable and low-income countries. And here, Canada has been, in fact, a leader. Uh, let me switch. I've been talking in American dollars. Let me talk briefly in Canadian dollars from now on out. The Bank of Canada received about $19 billion worth of, of SDRs in August 2021. It's committed to reallocate 20% of that, about $3.8 billion Canadian dollars to vulnerable countries. Note that for Canada's foreign aid budget last year was about $7.5 billion. So this is half again as much. That's a big ramp up in the effort by Canada. Could they do more? They got 19 billion. They're only giving away 3.8 billion. Yes, they probably could do more. So could the whole global community. But what the global community is struggling with right now is how to use these SDRs to best effect. What institutions and mechanisms can be used to make sure this global liquidity flows to the right place? And once it's there, is well used. So, there, I think, again, there's an opportunity for Canada to be a leader. These SDRs are a very complicated technical financial instrument. There are huge numbers of technical reasons that obstruct their easy flow around the world, and I, I won't go into it now. But it, the, the technicians need a, key, a, a lead from the politicians to say, look, put aside your technical reason, find us technical solutions, get these SDRs out to where they're working. That political voice has not been heard uniformly. And I think Canada could, in fact, play that political voice. 
And as uh, Joanne mentioned earlier, as the Canada looks at its, its aid budget, its direct aid budget, it should see how it can increase its aid as well. Let me stop there. Thank you. Let me follow up. Um, how much of that $100 billion pledged by the G20 have actually been allocated? And if uh, and and what are you know what are the issues surrounding the uh, allocation of it? And what about some critics like the IMF's own former chief economist who says that you know you need more you can't loosen the conditions around this. Otherwise, you turn the IMF into an aid agency instead of sort of the 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 place of last resort when it comes to lending. I think you have to do distinguish the aid. Um aim from the liquidity aim. But in this kind of a crisis, the two are interrelated. Uh, if you look at the IMF's um, regulations for when you can, you, how you can use global reserves, how you can use the reserves in your own country, there are a whole set of reasons. You use them to help you uh, regulate your international trade flows. You use them to, to help you uh, uh, stabilize the value of your currency. But the last use is an emergency use which basically is you help them in an emergency to give, to, to draw on uh, the resources to, to buy things. And I think we're in an emergency right now. And so in some sense, again, this is the leadership that's needed to say, overall, the global reserve pot in the world is about $14.5 trillion. And it's sitting on central bank's balance sheet being used for what we call monetary purposes. Shouldn't some part of that be used for fiscal purposes to buy things that we need for uh, to, to get out of this economic mess we're in? That's a tough call. It requires leadership, uh, but it can be done. I feel like there's a parallel here in terms of um, the, you know, the vac releasing the vaccine patents, um, donating vaccines and, and delivering economic aid. Um, Joanne, I'm gonna ask you to, to chime in here. You know, what do richer countries need to do to change the way we think about how we deliver aid, whether it's vaccines or monetary aid? Mm -hmm. Um, that's a good question and uh, it's a touchy question but I think one of the things that we have to stop doing it's what I call the Hicks planning the high income country planning like they're the one who is like running the show and telling everybody you know how they're supposed to do according to their rules and I think that um, what we did you know with ACTA for example was a clear example of that and 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 I'm saying that you know with 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 uh, humility to a certain extent because the ACTA was put together in a time of emergency and people just say something got to happen. But the reality it was uh, basically they gather people from philanthropy, the big philanthropy, the Wellcome Trust, the Gates Foundation, and then they got you know some pharmaceutical companies, some high income country. They sat together and then they created the platform, and then basically at, at the at the outset. Uh, I would say uh, some some countries, which represent like easily a third of the planet population, were not invited. China was not invited. India was not invited initially, and then Russia was not invited. And and so um, so it is it is it is quite striking. And and so as long as we're going to create tools that pretend it's going to serve the global good and then could create some global good, but you don't bring around the table, you know, I would say a diverse representation of, of, of people, of player, um, you will always come up, you know, with blind spot, and you will always come up with things that are not responding to people's need. And, and so uh, I think that probably if you have had much more representation from LMIC, people would say, you got to have a clause of access when you deal with pharmaceutical because if you if you don't if you don't upstream negotiate an access for whatever discovery will happen once it will happen there's no way you're going to be able to do that and we did that as well with CEPI I was on the board of CEPI the coalition for epidemic preparedness innovation and I basically stepped down from the from from the board because of the access policy because they were not willing to just play harder with the pharmaceutical and the reality is, is pharma, and I do understand that pharmaceutical companies are not philanthropic or not humanitarian organization. I got that. 
On the other hand, when you've done massive amount of, of, of money and, put, and then you return on investment, I've been done. And then you've got massive amount as well of financement from, the, from public funds. You got to have to find a much better, I would say, uh, equilibrium, a balance in what we have found. And I think today it's obscene that, that people are clinging to, to, their, uh, to, to, to their intellectual property as they are right now. And, and so we need, and I, I do hope there's gonna be one of the, the I would say, um, political will that will come, up, come out of, of this pandemic that we will really start to work on a new model of end-to-end -end, end -end research and development platform where at the outset, the access policy will be in, and then will be, uh, I would say, uh, uh, how can I say that, enacted in a way that it will it would really happen, and and not making you know some sort of of lip service of mechanisms that cannot be basically uh, uh, can, cannot deliver. So so for me, it's my strong hope because uh, this is not the last pandemic we're going to go through. And, and it's a rehearsal for the next global, I would say, challenges that we're going to face together. Uh, we, we, you know, I'm sure that all of us saw the, the latest report from the Lancet on AMR and the number of a million of people are dying. And this is only an early, uh, I would say, it's an appetizer of what's coming towards us. So, uh, so definitely, uh, I think that we need to change our way of doing. We need to put, if we want to have new solution, uh, new uh, ideas, uh, we need to stop having the same player playing poker around the table. Thanks, Joanne. Um, I was surprised to find out that Canada has actually been holding up the release of patents at the WTO. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm, how difficult is it to to kind of put a policy in place like you described joanne when there are corporate interests at stake like big pharma who are in their lobbying micah you talked about this a little bit can you um address that uh how hard it is to uh implement a drips waiver i think uh dr you probably has more and <laughs> more expertise than me on that but i think it's 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 a question of political will i think uh it has been done again it has been done in the past it's not like it's the first time and and uh, south africa and india were asking for that at the beginning of the pandemic in the first months they knew already because we we live we went through that for uh, a H1N1 uh, a few years ago, it's not like it's it's in the first pandemic. It's it's always like a, a trial and error type of thing, but now it's it's gone for longer than it used to be. So we're, we're kind of looking in the past and, and looking what we could have done two years ago when people were saying what we actually could have done. So I think it's a, it's a political issue. And as you said, I was also surprised to see that Canada was not at the forefront of this, of this battle. And that even compared to the United States, we're, we're really the last student here in, in the, the last student of the, of the class uh, in terms of promoting solidarity and uh, in, it would not be the end of the world. Pharmaceuticals would still make money. The world would still go around, even if we would open uh, the, the books and, and share the patents. It's not like every country could produce the vaccine. Not everyone has the capacity. It's a few countries who have the capacity who could do it. And so I think it's really a question of political will. There is, and Joanne, you brought this up, so it's a great segue. We journalists love segues. Um, there's, it's widespread agreement that COVID-19 has just been a trial run for the next pandemic that might be deadlier uh, or um, how we should tackle climate change. And I think it's fair to say that we failed um, as a global community when it came to COVID-19. Mark, can you talk about that a little bit? Um, what lessons do you think we've learned and and maybe what lessons do we not want to learn or we're refusing to see? My colleague at the Center for Global Development, I think 18 months into this crisis, was a commented that he was astounded that 18 months in, we hadn't figured out how to vaccinate the world. And now we're two years in and we still haven't figured it out. Um, and I, 
it, I think the, the, the fundamental thing that, that is lacking in the politics is people don't realize that what happens in Zimbabwe is going to affect what happens in Canada. Is going to, uh, Kinshasa and Ottawa are intimately linked. Um, and you see this now, particularly with Omicron, that it's seeping into places that manage to wall themselves off from, from, from the world. Uh, the Pacific Islands, Tonga, well, Tonga's a bad example, Kiribati didn't have any cases, but this week it has. And this interconnectedness, I think, is what we didn't understand. Intellectually, I think many of us understood it, and lots of people paid heed to it. But what that means when you actually start making policy is what we don't understand. Countries can't turn inward and say, I'll take care of my own first, and then I'll worry about the world. And that was the reaction. Okay, us first, and then the world. And the multilateral institutions uh, didn't step up to the plate. And these are the things that we've designed really to to get over this uh, inward lookingness, the World Bank, um, the African Development Bank, the Asian Development Bank, big institutions like this are supposed to bring the world together. And I really feel that they weren't prepared either for this type of global, um, uh, global economic event. We had viewed economic events as, as things that affected one piece of the world or another. And now we've got something that's affected the entire world. We don't have the institutions or the mentality to deal with it, at least in my area, in a financial sense. And that's why we have to think about what the world's resources are rather than what one country's resources are. We have to strengthen the global, the, the, the international financial institutions, uh, the multilateral banks. We have to put our faith in them. But we have to demand they do a better job as well. Joanne, do you have anything to add to that in terms of lessons learned and lessons we still have have to learn from this <laughs> well um i just find it fascinating that um that um we ask ourselves this question to a certain extent i think that um and it was john enkinson who said that the the ed africa cdc um and we said it as well at the independent panel, after the Ebola outbreak in 20, from 2014 to 2016 in West Africa, there were so many commission and, and expert uh, panels. There were 14 of them. And basically about less than 10% of the recommendation were implemented. And you could actually, and he just said that in an interview, you could actually take some of those reports change the word Ebola for COVID-19, and you probably will get, you know, a blueprint uh, roadmap for uh, for what to do next. So 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 the reality is 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 um, I think that uh, we uh, we haven't learned that that and and I would echo what Mark said. We're so interdependent and interconnected, and and so if we don't learn that we we have to come together in front of those global uh, threat, uh, we will not do better next time around. And and so uh, and so we we said that before, and it, it's 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 unfortunate, and and I do find it fascinating, and that um, this is one of the biggest crises that affected at the scale of the planet over the last few decades, and then uh, when we 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 met at the UNGA uh, this year in last year in September. Uh, one of the basic asks from the independent panel was to have a political statement about the pandemic being a, a, a global threat to elevate it to that level and saying, and so therefore, because we've paused, we put on pause our life collectively for the last, you know, 15 months, uh, we need to come together. It needs to be at the highest level of governance head of state need to pay attention because the response needs a cross governmental, uh, I would say input and efforts. And, and so uh, we need, to, we need to, to, to bring together our, our strength and forces to, uh, to do that. And you know what? We couldn't even get a political statement. That costs nothing, eh? And we know that words are cheap. We couldn't even do that. So can you imagine coming and then having resolution to change, you know, the way we're going to be? We're far from that. And people were very, very happy to just say, huh, 
let's you know pitch that to the to the world of assembly because they're going to do an extraordinary assembly in november and then to negotiate a treaty about pandemic and you know what you know of course you know if you do that but it's it is as if you're saying pandemic is like a technical issue and we all said it here it is not a technical issue it's a political economic social and, and and public health issue and so you need to bring all those different you know perspectives together and so if you leave it at the level of of the world of assembly it's going to be treated as a technical issue and you will not get what micah said that the political will and power behind and then to push to get things to happen and so i'm i'm i'm, I'm i remain you know flabbergasted that, that this has been one of the biggest crises that we are witnessing and going through. And all of us individually, individually have been affected professionally and personally by it. And we still don't get the drive to come together. And that bring me very, very, that make me very, very concerned is how we're gonna tackle the climate change, uh, I would say threat that is all there right in front of us, moving and being there uh, since we're not able to tackle this one. That doesn't bode well for climate change or the next pandemic, but I mean, it, it's the world seems to be quite fractured right now geopolitically. There are the divisions are deeper. Um, so, you know, it, if we can't come together when there's a crisis like a pandemic that is affecting everybody, it um, doesn't doesn't make me very optimistic about, you know, how we how we meet the next challenge. Um, Micah, do you have any confidence, speaking of you know, meeting the next challenge in leadership, that Canada can, can repair some of our reputation on the world stage? You know, we did not get that seat at the UN Security Council, which I think spoke volumes about where other people see us right now. Um, and we seem to be taken over um, as that middle country that, you know, punches above its weight by other countries like Norway. Can you talk a bit about that? Yes, I think, uh, I mean, I, I've, I'm usually a, a person of uh, fundamentally optimistic, which uh, I think is hard these days to uphold, but I, I am optimistic. I have confidence that Canada could re repair its image in a sense because uh, we haven't proven that uh, we, we were able to be leaders in, in terms of multilateralism and, and solidarity, but I think I have hope. But as uh, Dr. Liu and, and uh, Dr. Plant said, I think we need to learn our lessons for this crisis, for this crisis response, but also our general attitude towards the next crisis. We mentioned the climate crisis, and I would, I, would, I, I, I fear that we won't be able to learn the lesson for dealing with that crisis, which is, uh, it's not, it's not at our doors. It's already like in the living room. We can't say that the climate crisis is coming at the, at the door. It's already in, and we're not dealing with it in, in, in a, in a with a global mindset. And I think I, I want to go back on, on the Hicks planning concept because we really need to write a book about that. I think it's genius. The high income countries explaining to other countries how to act and what to do. And I think uh, that's been, that's, I think for me, one of the major lessons learned in that, in that uh, crisis is that uh, we, we had such an ethnocentric mindset in terms of our search for solutions. Not just, I mean, we had also a kind of a, ethnocentric mindset in terms of like closing our borders to African countries with, who had Omicron, but not to European countries who had Omicron and even closing our borders to African countries who did not have any cases of Omicron and then letting uh, European countries get in and how to learn from our, our fear that it was going to be a, a disaster in Africa. And when the virus would touch the, the shores of Africa, remember how we were talking about that? And then the, the reality proving that Europe has been the epicenter of uh, the crisis. And so things like that, that proves that we still have a lot to do in terms of changing our mindset um, and uh, and stop thinking that we are the best and, and start considering everyone as epistemic agents at all the countries and especially countries where there is expertise in terms of dealing with pandemics. And I'm not talking about <laughs> Western countries in general, the expertise is, is in a lot of different places. So we need to act together. And uh, uh, as Dr. Liu was saying, I think this idea of including more players at the table. And I'm, 
uh, for knowing for knowing your work, I know you don't mean just in terms of representation. It's not just including more people at the table. It's it's thinking who arranged the chairs and it's reorganizing reorganizing the chairs. It's thinking about who wrote the agenda. And it's even maybe maybe we don't need the table. Maybe we should sit on the floor and just think differently about how we can deal with crises because we have not proven that traditional solutions are the ones that uh, are, are, are working. I, I, I don't think it's working right now, but to go back to your question, I'm, I'm optimistic because it's all Canada has, its reputation. And I think it used to have a great reputation as a, as a middle power, soft power. Uh, and I think we, we should aim to go back to that. I think I have faith <laughs> that we can go back to that. I would read that book if the three of you wrote it on explaining. Um, Running out of time, so I want to get to um, some questions from our audience. Uh, Arjan asks, can Mark comment further on PM Mia Motley from Barbados, her proposal to expand the SDR allocations, the need to scale this enormously, um, and also to address the growing climate crisis crept up along the health pandemic? Thank you. So, uh, yeah, I think uh, that was a very bold proposal by, by the Prime Minister of Barbados. Um, at the UN. Um, I think there is a case to be made for increasing the global liquidity and increasing the number of SDRs, but I think the most important thing first is to figure out what to do with the ones we have. $650 billion SD dollars worth of SDRs were issued in August. I'm not sure one of those has yet reached a poor country. They've been pledged. Canada has pledged to give money. They're going to give it to the IMF. The IMF will then give it in turn to the poor countries, but the money hasn't happened. So we've, we, we've got the first step. We've got the money created. We're starting on the second step, which is allocating it to the right places. But the, the proof of whether we're, what we've done is good or not is whether it changes something in uh, the, 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 the economically vulnerable countries. So before we want to start doubling and tripling this, we need to see what we've done with this money that we have. Then we can think about how we use this global liquidity better. I'll come back to something I said before. In some sense, there is this pool of reserves by central banks of about $14.5 trillion. It serves a financial function. Can it serve other functions as well? That's the real discussion the world has to have. It's a difficult discussion. And the prime minister is very much driving at that, at that principle implicitly. And so uh, I applaud her for doing that. Um, but I don't want to start creating lots of SDRs, if you will, if we don't know what we're going to do with them. And I think the world is still trying to work, work it out how to do it. Uh, it. It's frustrating that it takes so long. And again, it's, uh, it comes back to what we've been saying all along is lack of, lack of leadership. Nicholas asks, um, is it not time to consider just taxing Big Pharma, but actually taking these vaccine producers and other producers of essential medicines back into public hands, i.e. nationalizing them, or at the very least to consider building a publicly owned pharma company like Connaught Labs before it was privatized. Joanne? Micah? Well, if I may, I think it's, 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 a, it's a great idea. I think it's not a, an idea that is in a lot of political um, uh, programs. Uh, Quebec Solidaire in Quebec is the only one I think to uh, promote that. I'm not sure if the NDP does, but probably I think in terms of a pharmaceutical, like a Canadian pharmaceutical, uh, publicly owned, and I think it's it's a good idea. But I think it's a it's a re, it's a it's a very um, political idea. It's a it's a I would say more of a socialist leaning. I'm all for it, but I, I don't think uh, I'm going to see it in the next few years. But it, that's what we did with alcohol and, and, and uh, marijuana now. And so I think it's, it's not a bad idea. Um, Michael Klein has a few really great questions. I'm going to ask the first one to Joanne. Um, he says, it strikes me there's a parallel between equitable vaccine distribution and long-standing inequitable food distribution is it possible the same thinking methodology processes etc are being applied to vaccine distribution um that's a that's a, a great question and uh, i'm not an expert on food but the thing is the the issue about the vaccine 
uh, is the fact that everybody wanted it at the same time. And I think that's been the issue since the beginning of this, uh, of, of this pandemic, is how do you share the resources when there's scarcity? And, 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 and that is, there's, there's, and it, it's begging for what is our, our world governance about sharing of resources in time of scarcity. And we don't have a playbook for that. We, 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 we talk about it and we would have thought naturally that some, as I said before, that some of our multilateral platforms would have some, somehow pick up you know, the ball and run with it, but it really didn't happen this way. Uh, and and uh, I do think that it was a missed opportunity uh, that it didn't happen. So, so the, the, the difference you know, about food is, is actually the high income country has enough food, although they're somehow dependent you know, from production from other country. I agree with that and we are interdependent. But I'm just saying that I think for me, the issue is to come up with a sort of, of, of a game plan of how do we share resources in times of scarcity and what would be uh, the fair way of doing that. And, and, and right now, we, we, we have no, um, no, uh, no, no guidance and no way forward uh, that is acceptable for anybody. And no one is taking the leadership about that. And this is one of the things, you know, where Canada, middle, you know, middle, middle sized country, you know, where do you bring value? And, and this is one of the things when I was briefing Canada uh, before the UNGA and just say, why don't you take, you know, uh, the leadership and why don't you, you, you just go around and do a coalition of the willing to basically come with a political statement at the UNGA. No, you know, just stick out your neck a little bit. You know, you might just get, you know, a few slap, but you might, you know, just feel the win and then it might work. Couldn't get any, you know, there was no appetite for that. But um, yeah, so I'm just saying that, I'm just cautioning that, yes, there might be some parallel. On the other hand, it's a question of, of resources and scarcity balance. Um, Mark, this one's for you. How serious are the risks involved in relaxing the IMF's conditionality system? From Depends Lucas Sala, sorry. Sure. Depends what you mean by relaxing. I think, we're, pre we're, we're facing, particularly with climate, a different kind of crisis, where the, the crisis is over the long term. If we don't act now, the cost will be much higher later on. The cost looks high right now, but the cost is enormously higher later on. And so how do you sort of incorporate that potential cost in your analyses when you don't know really what, what's going to happen, there's lots of uncertainty as what and when it's going to happen. And so I think the IMS have to think more creatively about what risk is and what uncertainty is and how you incorporate that into what countries can afford. The IMF's conditions are really about what's affordable, what can be done now, what can be postponed. And it's become a very tricky time. I mean, I, I, one of the things that's impressed me about the discussion on vaccines is, in fact, it's not very costly to get vaccines to everyone. It's, I mean, I guess the IMF said that $1.50 billion, let's say it's even $100 billion. In the grand scheme of things, that's not a lot of money in the global economy. But we seem to be unable to make that short-term close investment for a longer-term benefit. And so I think the IMF has, to, has a responsibility to make sure the money is used well. What we don't want is giving countries money and it goes into the leaders' pockets and off into Swiss bank accounts, right? We have to make sure that it goes to where it's supposed to be going to and helps the country face the problems it's facing. But I, I, a lot more work is needed to be done on what the right actions are right now, how much they cost, and how we measure progress as we go along. Um, Michael asks you, I think, this one's for you, um, is it possible one of the limitations of the IMF is the use of debt instruments because they assume repayment, do they not? So if lower cash flow economies receive much greater IMF SDRs, do they not face a greater stress on their post-pandemic economies to deal with the new indebtedness when this is oh, actually, yeah, yeah sorry. So no, I think I think the, the question of debt is an important one. And it comes back to what I was saying before. How much do you invest now and what's the return going to be in the future? And when is that return going to come? And who is it going to be, who is it going to come to? When when a 
private investor invests in a company, they get the returns. When we invest in education or when we invest in health systems, the returns are to the society as a whole. Hopefully that increases productivity and the GDP is higher and you can pay back that loan. And so some careful thinking has to be done about what the investment pattern should be. To the extent that countries can be generous and give aid uh, without strings, that's great. But I think right now, you see all countries, the rich countries, constrained in their own budgets, worrying about how they're going to pay for their excesses, if you will, of the last two or three years, because they've all overspent. And so the piper has to be paid at some point. How are they going to do that and support developing countries? Uh, there's a serious discussion that has to be had about global debt and how you deal with global debt and what the debt pattern should be. Uh, and I think that's going to be one of the challenges in 2022 and 2023 is confronting the growing debt situation and then deciding, given that we have to do more investment, how do we finance that? Brennan is asking, um, other countries like India are capable of manufacturing vaccines. Why couldn't Western countries have made sharing patents a condition of buying large amounts of vaccine from pharmaceutical companies? Micah? Joanne? Um, yes, I think it's, it, it is, again, a question of political will. I, I think we're afraid that companies will react in a way that, uh, I mean, that they could, that saying, no, we're, gonna, we're not going to sell you vaccines. It's, it's a collective uh, action problem. It's a classic collective action problem is that if I ask pharmaceuticals to do that, will my neighbor ask that too, or will the, the company just decide to sell uh, to the, the highest bidder uh, and, and the ones that imposes less conditions. So I think uh, it has been done before. We just have to trust our, our partners and trust our, our neighbors and trust that everyone could do the same and take deci make decisions uh, that are binding and, and collective um, because we have taken a lot of good collective decisions which we have not followed like COVAX or other uh, public health initiatives in, at a global level. So I think for that kind of decisions, um, it, it needs to be done together and, and stick to it. And again, there is precedent. So I'm confident that we could do it in the future and, and impose political uh, decisions on uh, companies. But it's a problem of the system, the, the economic system we live in. If I was a company, uh, as Dr. Liu was saying before, it's not, they're not humanitarian organizations. So we understand how they act. It's normal that they're going to sell to the highest bidder because what we value in the capitalist system we live in is making profits. And so uh, it's, a, it's a question of, of uh, not changing the system, but dealing with the parameters that are uh, the system we live in and, and imposing some uh, conditions to companies. I think it's a, it would be a great idea. I was listening to David Malpass, um, the, um, the head of um, the, uh, now it's um, IMF, um, and he- World Bank, World Bank. World Bank, sorry, I was getting them confused. The head of the World Bank, and you know, he made an analogy. He said, capital is moving. And he sort of quoted um, the recent Microsoft purchase of this, I don't, you know, of this gaming company to the tune of, I don't know how many billion, $65 billion was it? Something ridiculous like that. And he said, think about how many vaccines that could buy for developing countries. You know, we can get out of the pandemic. You know, the capital is moving. It's just not moving um, the, it, the way we want. And I think that's what you were trying to say, Mike. It, we still, it's a capitalist system that we are trying to, um, try, trying to work in. Mark? Sorry. But was there a question there? Uh, question, no, the question there was, you know, you know, how do we, and I'm combining a few of the, the questions now, but the question is how do we, um, how do we streamline? Like how, how do we, I think I'm gonna ask, you know, we've developed, Michael says, we've developed visions of what should be, but not developed anywhere near adequate um, ways to actually do it. And so, you know, what do we need to do to try to do that? I mean, that's a very, that's a very tough question uh, and a good one. I think, uh, again, my hope is in multilateralism and in increased discussion. But I go back to what, what Joanne said at the beginning. You've got to get the right people around the table. Uh, and if you're going to have a discussion 
uh, about the about the capitalist system and you only bring the big capitalists around the table it's not going to be a very good discussion because they're going to say it's fine thank you very much let's let's just proceed and i think covid demands of us a very different kind of discussion with a different set of people around the table um, and climate will do that even more um, I mean, I, I'm often struck by the, the, the climate advocates rightfully are, are pushing on mitigation, that we need to mitigate uh, the, the carbon load in the atmosphere. But if you're a minister in a small African country, you go, why do I need to mitigate? Because what I do isn't going to affect the overall climate carbon load. It's the big guys that are doing this to me. And my voice isn't being heard in this whole discussion. I have a whole set of other development problems that I have to deal with. Why are you making me talk about mitigation? And so it's getting that multiplicity of voices and understanding um, the, the, the overall systemic impacts that I think is getting important. It's a hard discussion. It's easy to say and much harder to do. Okay, I'm just keeping an eye on our time. Um, we've just got a couple minutes left um, and I'm combining questions again now. Catherine uh, asks, how can citizens and governments, how can citizens best magnify their efforts? What can we do as individuals? And I think that's what a lot of people um, are also wanting to know. As individuals, what can we do? Anybody? Well, I'm, I'm going to take a first stab, but you know, like it's always a question that people ask is, is what can I do? And I think that, uh, that what can you do is A, you should talk about it and ask the right question because often, you know, indifference is what kills uh, the most. So that's one thing. And then you want, if you want to take it one step further, then you, you, you're going to move into action. And so uh, let's, let's, you know, be, uh, I would say, a little bit uh, opportunistic here, but but one.r just launched uh, a basically a, a, a call for uh, to prevent the next uh, variant. And you can go and write to our minister of Sage and just say, hey, we can prevent the next variant in if we really reach you know vaccine equity and then make it happen uh, through distribution. So I think that there's a one small thing, but the reality is a lot of people say, oh well, it doesn't really work. Well, you know, collective citizen, I would say, action work. And this is how we got the TRIPS waiver on ARVs with HIV and AIDS at the beginning of the millennium. And uh, we've got, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of signature. And at one point, you know, they had to do it. And this is how as well, if we want to take a very Canadian example, when we didn't want to go to the Iraq war and people went into the street, I remember, walking into the street and telling you know our prime minister we don't want that war and you know what we didn't go so guys stand up sign up and just do it micah mark we need to wrap up here so give your last thoughts on this yes i think it's a it's a great idea and it's always something i've been asked since i, I started giving conferences on, on solidarity and cooperation and what can we do so first ex exactly i think talking about it thinking about it be informed reading about it that's deconstructing decentering our mind about issues like it's not just happening here read about how it's uh, how the pandemic is in, in affected other countries vote for government who will uh, take uh, keep government accountable when they say something, when they say they're going to be a champion of multilateralism. Um, in, in campaigns, they, there's going to be elections soon. Ask about uh, foreign affairs, because it's never a topic, it's never a hot topic during elections, but I think it's it, it should be and we should talk about it more and that's the first step. And then taking action is for sure the next step. Mark, you get the last word. Uh, I think back to the discussion uh, on debt relief in the early 2000s. Debt relief uh, came about in the early 2000s because of concerted action by a whole group uh, of people who said this doesn't make sense. Uh, and they said it in lots of different ways. And so it's very important to say the same message in different ways, in your own way, from your own country, from the organization that you feel mostly most connected to. Because it's not a uniform message. Uh, and the, the more different places that are saying it, the better off they are. And everybody has to contribute to that. 
Thank you, all of you. I think we have to leave it there. Mark Plant, Mike Sonergy, and Dr. Joanne Liu um, for what's been a very fascinating conversation, difficult conversation. Uh, and thank you all for joining us. Thank you to the IRTP for, and one organization for setting this up. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. <laughs>